Hello and welcome to the presentation for Cataloging ETDs in Ohio, a weaving of IR innovations, cataloging standards, and library work workflow. The experience of Kent State University. Um, your presenters today are Svim McCutcheon and Peter Lysias uh, from Kent State University. Uh, I'm Terry Robinson and I'm going to be your moderator for this session. Uh, Hello, uh, thank you for coming. My name is Svim McCutcheon. I use pronouns she, her, and hers. I'm a catalog librarian at Kent State University Libraries, focusing on monographs and maps. My colleague, Peter Lysias, pronouns he, him, and his, is the music and media catalog librarian and began cataloging ETDs as well in 2018. Today, we're gonna to talk about Kent State University's experience of cataloging ETDs in Ohio, especially the interplay among the statewide institutional repository, our statewide consortium, and our individual libraries workflow. Our presentation is in three parts. First, we'll provide information on the current context and a little history. Uh, Ohio Link standards created for cataloging TDs, first in AACR2, then RDA. The tech currently in use we call ETDCAT, the consortial metadata harvesting tool, which creates basic MARC records from student supplied metadata. And I'll, I'll talk about the steps in KSU's workflow, which utilizes Mark Edit, OCLC constant data, and a tag team approach to cataloging. In the second part, Peter will demonstrate how we go about originally cataloging ETDs, pointing out the distinctive intellectual challenges they pose. And since KSU is a NACO library, he'll also demonstrate how we create a typical name authority record for an ETD author. I'll close with an update on upcoming uh, replacement, a successor to the Ohio Link ETD metadata harvesting tool, and the concurrent initiative to reassess and update the consortial ETD cataloging standards. In the interest of time, I'll fly through some of my slides in part one, but the slides will be available on the conference uh, website with speaker's notes and some additional reader's notes. Okay. KSU is a member of the Ohio Link Consortium, which has as members 88 universities and colleges plus the State Library of Ohio. We each have our own Sierra catalogs that are local and also the shared Ohio Link Central catalog from which patrons can place requests and material delivered from throughout the state to, to their home library, so interlibrary loan. Ohio Link hosts the Ohio Link ETD Center, an institutional repository devoted to ETDs from Ohio academic institutions. Uh, it contains over 103,000 ETDs. Uh, they're also searchable in Google Scholar. Currently, 35 of the 38 Ohio Link member institutions have students upload papers to the ETD Center. And you'll hear me refer to OCLC's bibliographic formats and standards during the presentation or the abbreviation BFAS. So for orientation, here's what the Ohio Link ETD Center looks like at the initial screen when you get on it. And what an individual ETD uh, looks like there, the website describing it. Uh, and the text is provided by the student author as they fill out their submission form. When I started at Kent State University in 2006, Universities all over were in the process of transitioning from manuscript theses and dissertations to electronic. And we catalog li librarians knew how to handle print theses and dissertations. Both they and AACR2 had been around a long time. But ebooks in general and ETDs, a special kind of ebook, were pretty new then. So Highlink formed a working group to develop consortial standards for cataloging ETDs. We did this. Our goal was primarily to serve the needs of Ohio institutions, but we did so with an eye to create standards that would, could be widely applicable and compatible with national international standards. We repeated that general process for RDA in the 2013-2014 timeframe, although that time around it was ETDs that were familiar and the cataloging rules were new. And I was a member of both working groups and, and now involved in the 2020 updates. On the tech side, in 2016, a KSU systems librarian, Mike Krejci, now retired, experimented and created what he called a software cataloging agent, a cataloging bot, 
This was a, a first used locally and then adapted for statewide use uh, in 28, uh, sorry, 2008 and created AACR2 bib records for ETDs. Um, unfortunately, in 2013, the tool stopped working when OhioLink both addressed a security issue and had a major upgrade. Concurrently, in 2013, RDA was coming into widespread use. The second statewide tool was ready in 2014. At first, it created AACR2 records only. Then in 2015, RDA bib, bib records became an option as well. Uh, these standards from OhioLink uh, for ETDs and other resources are both on the OhioLink website and also through the NDLTD website, Network Digital Library of Theses and Dissertations. I'll quickly run through a couple issues we grappled with while pulling together AACR2 standards. Might seem old hat now, but they were head scratchers at the time. You're welcome to read more about these in the reader's notes. Um, we determined that ETDs were the only or first version of the work, so they were born digital. And born digital ETDs were published. For his input on these and other quandaries through the years, we thank Jay Weitz of OCLC. During both the time periods the working groups were engaged, BFAS said apparently contradictory things on the topic of gov government publications and theses and dissertations. Given the information available at the time, we landed on the side of considering ETDs published by state institutions to be state level government publications. So for many years, we at KSU coded fixed field GPUB with an S. Within the past few years, BFAS has become clearer and landed on the opposite side. That ETDs are not considered government publications, so K KSU, we now leave it GPUB blank. So this is an example of something we'll revise in the upcoming version of OhioLink standards for cataloging ETDs. Another issue was that BFAS wording at the time instructed catalogers to use only local fields in the 790s for advisor and institution access points. Such information was considered fine in local catalogs, but not acceptable in OCLC master records. This seemed at odds with the new guidelines, since RDA specifically provided relationship designators for ETD advisors and the institution. So OhioLink wrote to OCLC and got a reply. OCLC folks were on board with OhioLink's consortial standards to include 700s and 710s access points for degree supervisors and degree granting institutions in master records and said an update to BFAS was planned, which has now happened. And just a couple of uh, examples there. Oh dear, that's a lot smaller than I'd hope. Oh, I see there. So now that we've discussed the content for ETD bib records, let's move on to the tech of getting the content into MARC bib records. Uh, just very quickly, here's a graphic overview of how KSU Systems Librarian Mike Krejci's initial cataloging bot worked for us locally in 2006. It used Perl, OAI, PMH, and ETDMS, which included a Mark 21 crosswalk. And um, at KSU, we call the resulting records coming out of the metadata harvesting uh, with ETDCAT provisional records because we consider them temporary, reasonably good descriptions for users to access immediately in the local and consortial catalogs until full OCLC cataloging can be done. However, some libraries, due to staffing or other issues, may accept this record as their final record. Once the ETD CATS work ends, KSU work begins. So here's some KSU context. Uh, Kent State University is a rather large university in a small Ohio city with about 38,000 students and multiple libraries, some at regional campuses. We typically get about 400 ETD papers a year uh, approximately 350 to 360 graduate level papers for which we do full level cataloging on WorldCat plus 35 to 50 undergraduate honors papers on which we do minimal level cataloging. 
At KSU, we've had the commitment to fully catalog theses and dissertations from back in the days of print manuscripts. When we transitioned to ETVs, the philosophy continued that it's a worthwhile endeavor to maximize discovery to the unique research and scholarly contributions of KSU graduate students. Two factors contribute to making this possible. We're a big enough library system to have multiple catalog librarians. So one, me, the monographs cataloger, has had main responsibility for TDs and now ETDs. Also, we've had a supply of iSchool students as temporary pre-professional catalogers. The only iSchool in Ohio is located just down the hall from our tech services department in the main library. The synergy has been win-win for several years. Internship students and paid hourly graduate student assistants do original cataloging under supervision, and they gain skills in an especially challenging activity and resource type. So my coworker, Peter, he goes to this OhioLink ETD Center interface to retrieve new ETD records with ETDCAT. And then uh, he selects among different document types, grad papers, and uh, then honors papers, uses mark edit to convert files and loads the same baseline bibs into two places, uh, KentLink, our local OPAC, and uses a few more Sierra tools like rapid, rapid update to tweak the records a bit more so patrons will have immediate access. And the second place is the OCLC online save file ready for further cataloging. The default ETD cat bib records are pretty good, but have some emissions and inputting quirks, including some that cause validation errors on OCLC. So the local mark editing we do at KSU makes an additional layer of changes to the baseline bibs. Here's a representative sample of the changes. And a few more. After those two processes, an ETD bib in Sierra will look like this. Now people get involved at the individual bib level. In the first part of tag team cataloging, a student worker, typically an undergrad, figures out which ETDs to tackle next by searching Sierra by a local field we insert for identification. Uh, then finds that same bib in OCLC and does descriptive cataloging. The student applies a constant data record, examines the full text plus the website, and follows internet instructions to verify, fill in, edit, and correct data we couldn't easily do by automatic methods. And to give you a sense of what's in the constant data record, uh, here it is, uh, primarily reminder fields. Don't forget to add these things, delete if not applicable. The student records on our ETD tracking spreadsheet info about the bib and its status to communicate with the cataloging specialist who will get involved next. And uh, bib record number four by Fatima Nafa will, you'll see a lot of her, her work today as an example. The descriptive cataloger also communicates via the spreadsheet that an ETD author might need a NAR, a name authority record such as when there's a discrepancy between forms of name in different sources. When the bib in the OCLC online save file is ready for handoff, it looks like this, uh, ready for the original cataloger to start on. And the next two slides are the rest of the bib record. A cataloging specialist, either a catalog librarian or a graduate student assistant under supervision, does the second part of tag team cataloging, what we call the original cataloging part. And my colleague Peter will take it for here, from here for part two. Thank you, Savim. Um, so next we go on to part two. So after uh, descriptive cataloging has taken place, um, and the professional catalogers focus on the more unique challenges, cataloging ETDs, which have primarily to do with classification, subject analysis, and authority control. Next slide. So after descriptive cataloging is done, I perform subject analysis using Library of Congress subject headings and medical subject headings. Um, 
right by the National Library of Medicine. Then I assign classification. And then I evaluate access points. Next. Okay, so uh, for subject heading analysis, the uh, primary sources for subject are the title, abstract, summary field, self-assigned terms by the author, and some other places too I go, uh, the department website, the body of the dissertation, and also Google. And some of the issues with this uh, that are challenging, um, these very specialized topics, usually one subject heading isn't enough, and uh, creativity is often required within these parameters of LCSH. And then you just do your best with all of that. Next slide. So first considering the content of the title. So in our dissertation, Mefatima Nafa, you'll see uh, there's the title there. And then uh, I just focus on the principal parts of that title. So hidden cognitive skill dependency, knowledge units, Markov Cognitive Knowledge State Network. Next slide. And then the content of the abstract, um, that should match what the title implies, but that's not always the case. So you have to determine what's the same, what's different, and is there new content introduced that's not introduced or not mentioned in the title. Next slide. And so I transcribed uh, the the abstract from the dissertation bibrec, and then I just uh, highlighted these terms that I would focus on, and some of them duplicate what's in the title, but basically I go through like I was reading an article in college and just highlighting terms as I read. Next slide. So some of the old concepts that were first found in the title include uh, cognitive still dependencies and the Markov Cognitive State Knowledge Network. And some of the principal new concepts introduced in the abstract including the following terms that you see below. Next slide. Self-assigned terms are assigned by the author and harvested on the Mark OCLC records in Mark Field 653. And uh, so our author, she assigned cognitive psychology, computer science. Then again, you look what's common among all the areas you've looked at so far. So in this case, the self-assigned terms are added. In our example, cognitive psychology is found in all three areas, and computer science is found in two. Next slide. It's a multidisciplinary topic. You give primary consideration to the department in, the in which the dissertation was created. Um, so in the body of the so the body of dissertation is also useful. You can't make sense of everything that you look so far in the title abstract or self-assigned terms. And then you can go to Google to find information. And any sources providing a layperson's explanation. And one reason I selected this dissertation uh, to present on, I, I did this at a ETD summit in Ohio link back in March. I'm an arts and humanities person, so I want to demonstrate what someone like me would do to look into something in the hard sciences and catalog, provide access. Next slide. The subject heading assignments, there's two columns here. So the concepts that are brought up um, in all the areas I've looked for thus far, and then you go into LCSH and MESH to determine uh, what those headings are. So you'll see uh, from those non-catalogers out there, the M dash is preceding uh, additional terms uh, indicate uh, subdivisions. So those are some of uh, the correlating uh, subject headings with subdivisions that I found. And mesh, those are some of the other terms I found in mesh. Next slide. So here is a slide uh, showing how all these access points looks looking like on a bib rec. So the first five are LCSH terms. Uh, they're hot linked, so they go right back to the subject authority file. So you can see 
the actual subject headings and subject heading subdivision files. Uh, mesh headings, the medical terms are next. There's three of those. And then the self-assigned terms are in the Mark 653 field. And LCGFT is the Library of Congress genre form term. And we always assign academic theses to those. Next. Okay, next we move on to classification. So when I classify, it's always best to do a subject analysis first. Classifications based on LCSH using Library of Congress classification web. Uh, the first subject heading is the basis of classification, but if two or more subject headings are given equal prominence, you would search all those terms in class web. Um, and uh, then you pick the best term, and sometimes the best way to do that is go back to the department school. If one classification is better, you move the subject heading terms as appropriate. Next slide. So in our dissertation, we found two nearly equivalent terms. And then if we look in the next slide to see the result of those searches, you'll see that on the left, the cognitive science, psychological aspects is BF311 else in the Library of Congress classification. And then BF201 is cognitive psychology, and that's actually a C from the same range where we found uh, cognitive science, psychological aspects. Next slide. So here we have the hierarchy and class web for both terms and the classification of what that is. So uh, cognitive science, psychological aspects, uh, BF11, 311's general works, and then BF201's cognitive psychology. So next slide. So the winner here is cognitive psychology. It's the most general classification term. BF311 was about consciousness and doing a keyword search over the entire dissertation uh, yielded no hits. So, and cognitive science is hierarchical to cognitive psychology. And though both terms are already on the bib rec. Next, next slide. Okay, so based on this, we swapped the first two subject headings, which sometimes happens after you do classification. Next slide. So this is a breakdown of the classifications. So BF201 is the, the classification for the topic. Uh, point N34 is for NAFA, N, and then the AF to three and four based on the cutter tables for 2019 for the date it was published. Next slide. So I'm gonna to try to sail through these so you don't have time to wrap up, but authority control is a process by which bib recs are organized in a library catalog. And you see some of the considerations down there. I uh, basically have authorized access points, um, variant access points which point to those authorized access points and all these exist behind the scenes in the ILS, and they link Bibrex to which a particular name, et cetera, are associated. And these are all found in the National Authority file, which can be viewed publicly on the LCE website or uh, the OCLC connection as we're cataloging. And those two places have identical content. Next slide. So some considerations and terms here the catalogers use and manipulate these records in the national authority file, and these are called name authority records or NARS. So those of us with authorization to do that are NACO certified, and we can update or may put new ones in there, and that's run by the program for cooperative cataloging at LC. Next slide. So at Kent State, three of us are certified to do NACO, and we also train high school grad students to do it when they're available and all of us contribute through NACO regular. And I also have two additional ones in my work with uh, music and uh, AV based names. Um, these NARS, yeah, we, and we, uh, we usually do them for NACO regular. So next slide. Types of names, so that might have to be created new or vetted, authors, advisors, departments and schools. Next slide. Uh, primarily, Mary, Primary priority where we work on them every time, there's a conflict in the NAF, and we need a NAR to break the conflict. 
the author has a compound surname, and that'll yield a variant access point. And then catalogers' judgment if they'd have difficulty accessing a name without the NAR. And some of the secondary priorities include differences of name, there's a suffix, uh, the author's an international student, or there's a year of birth. Next slide. So in our dissertation, so the author's names are found at the top of the bib rec, the advisor and department names are found at the bottom. Next slide. So uh, there's no authority record for the author, and this is a second priority name. Um, and actually the third thing down the list is catalogers judgment. Um, patrons probably wouldn't have access, have problem accessing the name that's actually still falls in a primary priority, but uh, we'll move on to the next slide. And then uh, you can see some of the things that, are that make that a secondary priority there. Uh, you can look at that later. And uh, I made a new NAR as a judgment call here, but it fit three of the four secondary considerations. So next slide. So here's a picture of our author in question. I was able to get some good information here off our Office of Global Education website, a picture of her, and uh, there's a link to her, a uh, little bio on her. So next slide. Here's what an authority looks record looks like for her after I've gone through all that. So these different fields start in the three, starting with 3.7, 3.7 X fields, uh, mean different things like place, uh, a field of activity, uh, uh, associate institutions, and the fact she's a graduate student and a woman. Next slide. And then these 670 notes, what's in black below are those fields blown up. 670s are where you document all the information you're going to put the body of the authority record in. So the sources and uh, um, and the last slide here, um, yeah, so the next one, we got an advisor, next slide. Uh, we didn't make an authority for the computer, the computer science because it was so generic and there were no problems with it, so next slide. And then here's how the uh, appropriate fields look after you've vetted everything, so next slide. And other examples, authors and advisors and departments with name changes. We uh, I don't have time to talk about that now. And I think the next three slides are how the bib and looks in uh, in our local uh, ILS Kent link. So Sabim, I'll turn it over to you now to wrap things up. Okay. All right. I'll close here in this part with an update on current OhioLink ETD activities and muse a little on the KSU context. There are two closely intertwined activities going on now at, on the OhioLink level with ETDs, creating a new way to get ETD baseline records and updating standards to go along with. The new metadata harvesting method currently in testing uses the OAI PMH feed from the ETD center with MarkEdit. The goal is to get as much done to the records upstream and automatically from OhioLink as possible so that when libraries load bibs, they'll have as little local editing as possible to do. I find this very appealing, very much in the spirit of efficient, labor-saving cooperative cataloging programs. Concurrently, we're working on an update and reassessment of the consortial ETD cataloging standards for RDA. In, uh, uh, in February of 2020, Ohio Metadata and ETD coordinator Emily Flynn contacted me and Joan Milligan of Dayton University to review the test records being created. And because we had both been active on the Ohio Link standards for ETDs uh, in RDA working group and reviewing BIB records in the past. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're at a five minute warning. Thank you. Examining the first batch of ETD bibs generated by the new tool, we came up with a list of requested changes for programmers to make for the next batch. And we got feedback from folks on the Ohio Link ETD Council, of which I'm a member, and brought a review by some constituents, volunteers from the Ohio Link ETD discussion list to step forward. 
Uh, next, we'll pro be providing Ohio Lincoln programmers with the request for adjustment document to inform the content of the next batch of test records. And there will be more opportunities for Ohio Lincoln members to examine and give feedback on the bid records. At some point in the fairly near future, when as a group we find the ETD baseline bid records in good shape to meet our needs, uh, the consortium will make the switch from the current method to the new method. It was the request to test uh, that prompted the, to the review for content standards, but it's also come at a good time. In the past several years since they were last written, there have been changes and developments in standards at the international level. One thing that made this time around so much easier and straightforward than previous times is that OCLC's bibliographic formats and standards section pertaining to theses and dissertations got that recent overhaul. So itself is up to date with current standards. So in terms of Kent State, uh, at our metadata and cataloging department, we do full level cataloging for ETDs as well as other resources our libraries acquire. We've been in a fortunate position in which we have the skills and human resources significantly augmented by iSchool graduate student personnel to do so. I find that original cataloging ETDs is an excellent way to teach graduate students complex and marketable skills in preparation for the future library careers. However, recent and current shifts are affecting the availability of iSchool graduate students as both student workers and interns. Uh, the iSchool has been a fully online program for some years. So for on-campus jobs, candidates must consider logistics of driving time and parking to a campus they wouldn't normally come to. As of 2018, internships are no longer required. They are optional instead. On the library side, uh, the library's student budget uh, had constraints. These were preceded by the COVID-19 pandemic, but have been exacerbated by it. Pay rates of KSU library student jobs were not particularly high compared to off-campus jobs in general. And now both the total number, number of library student jobs and the types that are eligible for middle and higher tier pay rates have been sharply reduced. So grad students must consider uh, and contrast the lure of gaining professional skills and letters of reference with the viability of the wage. So what does this mean for monographs and ETD uh, in our cataloging unit. I suspect that the trend is fewer people with the high skills and less time available to those people to devote to challenging original cataloging. For now, we're simply monitoring the situation and haven't made any changes as to priorities or levels of cataloging. Especially with the added layer of COVID-19 repercussions and uncertainty, we're waiting to see what's a shorter term anomaly and what's the new longer term norm. Uh, any decisions uh, that we would be making uh, that would impact end users will be sure to discuss with our public services and reference librarians. Thank you, Svim and Peter. Um, I think that kind of takes us to the end of the time. Um, looks like, Peter, you answered the question that was in the chat. Um, so I think if there's any additional questions, we can probably refer them to the chat as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. That was very informative. I'm always in awe of the cataloging magic that catalogers do. So thank you for sharing your methodologies.